you're fucking out. He's fucking in. <laughs> what do you got to say about Lance Lenore? Uh, I think he might be fucking out too. <laughs> you're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your hosts, Andrew Chang and Justin Goddard. Hello and welcome to the Wander in Buffalo podcast, now a part of the built-in Buffalo family. My name is Andrew Chang and alongside me is my co-host Justin Goddard. Tonight, we're going to talk about some injuries and how they could derail the Buffalo Bills in the 2021-2022 NFL season. Uh, more games equals more opportunities for injuries, Justin, so we got to talk about this. As always, you can find us on social media, podcasting platforms, and even on YouTube by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You can also find our show as well as other amazing content by looking into the Built-in Buffalo Podcasting Network. They got amazing things going over there, so check them out. Tonight, we also have a Wandering Buffalo interview with our close friend, Justin Jordan D'Angelo. But first, how are you doing? I'm doing great, my friend. Thank you. Uh, I'm just... Just made it back in from uh, a little weekend off. We actually took a travel into enemy territory down in Beantown. You know, oh, yeah? Yeah, behind enemy lines, you know what? They got a Wegmans out there now. Oh. I still got to go Bills out there in Massachusetts. That's that's pretty big. And for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to kind of put you on blast here, your girlfriend is a Patriots fan. Mm. A little bit. How was that for her? Uh, I mean, it sucks for her now because our team's better now. Five <laughs> years ago, it would have been rough. But, yeah, she's got family right, out right. in there. She's a, she's a little bit of a Patriots fan, and we make it work. Hey, well, it's, it sounds like a divided house, but at the end of the day, you can always say the Bills had a much better season than the Patriots did. No. So, <laughs> Josh Allen, greater than Cam Newton. <laughs> By far. All right. Let's break into let's get into some Buffalo Bills related news. So the Bills released an undrafted free agent, Trey Walker, and they signed a wide receiver, Lance Lenore. He was kinda on and off the Cowboys practice squad. All I can think about this is you're fucking out, he's fucking in. <laughs> what do you gotta say about Lance Lenore? Uh I think he might be fucking out too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah i mean i knew very little about trey walker you know guy that just kind of got signed to the team uh i i know just as little about lance lenore so you know doing my due diligence i tried to do a little research on him you know watch a little mm. watch a little film and mind you this is i'm looking up highlight reels you know i only want to see the good stuff he does and <clears throat> excuse me the first highlight reel i put on the first the first clip I see is him fumbling a punt, losing possession, turning it over like inside their own ten yard line. And I'm like, okay, that's an interesting way to start out a highlight reel. I keep watching. The second one he calls for a fair catch. He bobbles the return. He maintained possession, but it's kinda like, you know, this seems yeah, it's like, like the pulse. Yeah. It seems like the type of guy that we're bringing back bringing in for competition for return duties and i'm mm -hmm. i'm trying to see the positives on a you know a little known commodity and that's the first couple of things i see i'm all the way out on lance Lenore. maybe i'll be yeah. wrong i don't think so yeah i mean he's entering a pretty crowded wide receiver room and if you're if you were an undrafted free agent and you know you probably don't want to come to buffalo because it is such a stacked team and then you definitely don't want to be here if you're a wide receiver because the the odds of you getting on the field or the practice squad is slim to none. Just hoping to put up some preseason film. Unless, of course, injuries happen. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But let's get into some other news. The season tickets have been sold out, Justin, which means fan noise. Fan noise, fan noise, fan noise. Home field advantage. Best believe I'm going to go to as many home games as possible. I, I don't know about you, but we got to go. 
so you know how old I am. Uh, you like to talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'll probably go to one or two. Maybe maybe bring the podcast down there, meet some of the fans, do a little episode like that. That'd be um, cool. Me personally, I love that there's fans back in the stands. I will be staying myself on the couch. Those 1 o'clock kickoffs, I love it. I'll go to a game or two. I like getting in the atmosphere. I like being around for a couple of them. Um, but especially being out in Rochester now, you know, mm-hmm. you got to get up at like 6 a.m. to do it proper. You know, you're talking getting there for a nice 8 a.m. tailgate. You got an hour and a half on each end of that day. So turns into a long day. I like my Sunday at one routines, but we'll definitely, you, me, Jake, we'll get out there for a couple of them. Absolutely. It's also been reported from Sports Business Journal that non-vaccinated players will continue to be subject to daily testing and quarantines after exposure. I understand this is a hot topic, but it it does mean that this COVID hurdle is still a thing, even though the vaccines are out. So we have to talk about them because... It will interrupt the Bills' operations and how things can run smoothly. We can have those setbacks, so it's something that we need to discuss, Justin. Yeah, I mean, there's really not much of a surprise to me here. I mean, as long as COVID's going on, I I went as far as to say, you know, I wanted football last year, but it was kind of irresponsible to just forge ahead with it. Mm-hmm. And overall, I feel like the league did a pretty good job of staying healthy and containing outbreaks and whatnot, except for, Mm -hmm. you know, a couple instances. Until COVID's gone as a thing, I mean, I could see this pushing past this season, you know. You don't really know how long it's going to stick around for, um, for the safety of players and and all that that goes into it. I'm, I'm not surprised and I'm not really upset if they have to do a test you know, two, three, four times Mm -hmm. a week. Um, But I do like that it's not being a mandated vaccine. Like, you can't play this year if you don't have it or anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you know, these players are still people. They still have their own personal choices, whether Mm -hmm. you agree, disagree, don't really care. Um, It is still their choice. and Or religion, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I don't... To each his own. To each his own, right. Right, right. Uh, Well, Dan Graziano from ESPN said that the NFLPA and the NFL have agreed to a salary cap ceiling of $208.2 million for the 2020 season. That's a 14% increase, Justin. I think this means we definitely are going to get two extensions on the way, Josh Allen, Tremaine Edmonds. I I foresee that happening. So what I see here, and... Maybe I read it wrong. I thought I saw the the floor was at 208. Oh, maybe I got it wrong. I believe the floor is at 208, so it could mm-hmm. still potentially go up. Um, but once the floor is set, it won't go down, um, mm-hmm. you know, barring another global pandemic. God, please no. Um, but overall, I think this is great news for a team like the Bills. Um, we're pressed right up against the cap. And having that number that you know that you're working with jake jake chirped in here it is the ceiling so Mm -hmm. we'll operate as that for now um but having that number in your back pocket now you know that number when you're looking at how you structure a deal like josh allen's um you know that number going into next year if you want to you know maybe do a couple restructures kick some money down the road to free some stuff up this year Mm -hmm. i mean i wouldn't be surprised if we see Something like, you know, a Stefan Diggs restructure and pay raise, which he's obviously, you know, earned. Um, but it could be kind of mutually beneficial where we see him restructure, kick a little money down the road, and maybe you bring in one more veteran name to really try to put this roster over the top. Um, for me, that is not Julio Jones. Love Julio mm-hmm. Jones. Would love to see it in some sort of video game format but Mm -hmm. for me that's a guy like former Steelers cornerback uh Steven Nelson um I I think he's like a fringe cornerback one and lining Mm -hmm. him up 
opposite Trey would just really open up what we can do as a defense. Um, still seems a little far fetched, but you know maybe you predicted it like episode two that you thought the Bills were going to bring in Richard Sherman. I mm-hmm. think that puts somebody like him back on the table. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. And speaking of extensions, the Bills have re-signed and extended long snap, long snapper, sorry, Reed Ferguson to a three-year contract deal. I love it. The guy is so consistent. He always plays, and he's just good. He's a likable guy. And I think that's a great way to end the new segment, Justin. Yeah, that that goes into uh, things that we called when we did our uh, positional breakdown and we went through special teams. Uh, I, I predicted or just asked the Bills, give that man the highest paid contract for a long snapper in the league, and he just got it. Let's go. Yeah. Love Definitely. Reed. Definitely, let's go. Locking up cornerstone pieces of our franchise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for this week's Bills-related news update. Let's dive right into our Wandering Buffalo interview with our guest, Jordan D'Angelo. Special guest, fellow co-worker at Rochester's Finest Italian, Florida Transplant, our good buddy, Jordan D'Angelo. How are you doing tonight, Jordan? Hi, I'm doing good. How's everybody doing out there? We are doing great. Nice Glad to, to have you, you in, Jordan. Hey, pleasure to be here. Long time coming. You know yeah. it. I've been waiting all these weeks, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, when we started this podcast, we already knew in our head, like, hey, we got to get Jordan on here, and the stars finally aligned. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, your name, what you got going on right now, where you're from, stuff like that. Hey, well, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, my name's Jordan D'Angelo. I'm going to be 35 here in a couple days on June 4th. And uh, I was born in Rochester and uh, lived there till I was about 12. And I'm um, always a big time Bills fan. And then uh, moved down to Vero Beach, Florida for uh, almost 20 years. And then about three years ago, I ended up moving back up here with my uh, fiance, and then I brought my dad back and everything. I always told him we'd always make it back up here, and it only took 20 years to do it, but here we are. Hey, hey, nice. I always, I always forget when you when you start talking about it that you got the same birthday as my father. So No kidding. Happy All right, birthday. I'm in good company it, it, here then. Yeah, it's coming up. Good man. So tell us a little bit. Who, influ- who influenced you the most as, uh, like, in your formative years becoming a Bills fan? Well, I would have to say my father. And as the folklore goes, I don't know if there's any truth to it, uh, but my dad was a big-time New York Giants fan. And he even, you know, had New York Giants bed sheets and curtains for me in my room and all that. And uh, as the story goes, I was about three years old football Sunday my dad comes in my room he says hey George you ready for the Giants game I pointed at a shirt I says what's that he looked down I bopped him in the nose I says I'm a Bills fan and ever (laughs) since that day I've been true blue wow I have never (laughs) heard of that story before but oh and uh as a side note I have converted him into a Bills fan for the past 10 years he's a he's now a diehard uh, Bills mafia so let's go yeah, <laughs> you, you, you beat it into him. <laughs> it was the clear and obvious choice. Right. So when did you migrate to Florida again? Uh, it was 98, 99, somewhere around there. I was about 12, 13 years old. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it, was a, it wasn't the transition I wanted, but. The dark days. Right. So <laughs> what does that mean? Like you were in middle school, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going into eighth grade at that time. Okay, so from personal experience, you migrated after middle school. Can you fill the people in where you've lived? So you said Vero Beach, Florida. Yeah, Vero so- Beach. I moved. I moved to uh, Vero Beach. I went to high school in Sebastian, which is probably like half an hour north of there. And, oh, okay. uh, and then I lived in Vero for the rest of the time. And uh, it's centrally located. It's on the east uh, east coast, and um, mm-hmm. it's nice. It's a, you know, it's a hidden gem still, and all that, but. My heart right. was always back up here. Can a little you, hot down there. Yeah, yeah, too hot for my blood. Too hot, too hot. 
So can you tell us what Florida Bill's life was like for you? Like, were I gotta people tell you, dicks to you? <laughs> they were. Yes, they were. <laughs> uh, especially first getting down there. But I got to tell you, I thought I would be the only Bills fan down there. And guys, Bills Mafia runs deep down there. Let me tell you something. And uh, it was tough. And it was definitely Miami territory and all that. And uh, But there's a healthy rivalry still going on down there. And uh, honestly, I went to plenty of games down there in Miami. And it's almost like a Bills home game when you go down there. It's it's uh it's a we there's there's plenty of Bills fans for sure. That's great to hear. And does it feel weird that you're back home now, or is it exactly how you remembered in terms of being a Bills fan? Oh, uh, it's it's a lot like I remember it for sure. It is weird. It's only surreal because of how long I spent down in Florida and how hard I tried to get back and how long it took. And now it's actually happening, and it's uh, it's everything I dreamt it could be. You picked a good time to come back. <laughs> Not bad, right? Oh, honestly. <laughs> right. right. So uh, give me both sides of the coin. You're down in Florida. Give me your, your worst day as a Bills fan in Florida. Give me your best day as a Bills fan in Florida. My worst one is an easy one to tell you. It was the first year I had been down there. Uh, it was a little thing called the Music City Miracle. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Ah. But uh, <laughs> you, we try to you skip had, that on this show. You had you had Doug Flutie in one shoe and one sock driving down the field, and all of a sudden, uh, a blatant forward lateral later. Uh, what did end up happening was I didn't talk to anyone for a week. I locked myself in my room. I didn't go to school for a week. I wouldn't even eat dinner or talk to my parents. And uh, I definitely shed a couple tears. Uh, mm. So that was most definitely the, the worst day as a Bills fan down there. Uh, best day? Uh, it's a good question. I went, uh, I'm not even going to lie. Uh, being down there uh, for 20 years, I went to... 15 Bills games, all losses. Uh, oh so God. that was tough. But, you <laughs> okay, know, so we stop going to games. <laughs> you know, I might be the bad luck fan. Who knows? But uh, we were going through some tough times then. So, but uh, we're, we're, we're coming out of that now. Hmm. So, last season was a blast, right? Oh. If you had to describe the season in one positive word, what word would that be? Win. All they did was win all year long. Win, win. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was awesome. It was so exciting. I'm so thankful for that season. We. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we needed at exactly a dark time in our lives, and it really it made everything all better. And you know what the most consistent thing about all those wins were, Jordan? What's that? You weren't at any of those games. So. Uh, I was at a couple. <laughs> I was at the home opener against the Bengals. And, uh, no, no, was no, broken. no, 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 <laughs> that, that was two years ago. Oh, that was two years ago, yeah. You really got me there. Yeah. <laughs> when you're right, you're right. No, no one was at any of those games. You got a good right, point. Right, right. I'm, okay. I'm still dating. I still date everything in 2020, and they. Uh, I wonder what's wrong. <laughs> you're good, you're good. <laughs> okay, so now, other side of the coin. If you had to describe the season in one negative word, what would you say? Oh, boy. Hail Murray. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fluke. Words, but that I'll was, count it. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Because, you know, we deserve that game, but it's okay. These flukes happen, and uh, we're, we're going to learn from it, and we're, we're not going to – that it's not going to happen again, put it that way. Did you cry and lock yourself in the room and – Shed a tear or two. <laughs> it's possible. You never know. Not so much. Not so. I was in a little bit of shock, but uh, I I knew we would pull out of that, no problem. So, yeah, nice. we talked about that one on this podcast before, and that was just like, it was just like shock for a couple seconds, and then I was like, God damn! I just saw like one of the greatest football plays I'll ever see happen live. Like you can't even be mad about it. I, I, I can't mad. be mad. I was mad about I... it. <laughs> Andrew I was salty, that's it. for sure, but uh, you know, oh. I'm not, I'm not wishing the Cardinals any luck. Let's just put it that way. Mm. All right, man. So, what are we? Fifteen Sundays out right now. 
Oh yeah, and counting. Yeah. So we're every day we're one day closer to a Bills regular season. So give us a little bit of a sneak preview. You got any big plans for this season? You going to any games? You got anything lined up? What do you think? Up? Home opener against the Steelers? Well, that sounds pretty decent. What's in the bag, bud? What's in the bag, <laughs> buddy? <laughs> So you, you know, it, upper. I, I guess the upper level starting at uh, 160. So I'll see you in the 300s. You know what I'm saying? See you in the 300s, buddy. <laughs> 300 strong. Yeah. No Be problem. watching most of this game on the jumbotron. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no problem. You got any my, other games lined up for the season? That's a good question. Uh, not at the moment, but I'm sure there will be. I don't have them lined up, but I'll be there. That's for sure. I'll see you in the hammer lot. We'll crush you, Polishies. Yeah, that's right. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, right, right. So I know Kristen is a Bills fan now, and for those of you who are yes. listening, Kristen is Jordan's fiance. And she's from Florida, so I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say she wasn't a Bills fan. But much like your father, you have converted her to being a Bills fan. Tell us That's right. how, the obstacles that – that challenge presented and how you eventually pulled it off. Well, okay. It just so happens that her father is a big time New York Giants fan as well. We're still working on him. Uh, okay. We haven't given up hope yet. But uh, Kristen wasn't even a big time football fan. Didn't really know the rules too much or anything like that. She would be nice enough to watch it with me. And, and uh, you know, I would show her a little bit here and there. And uh, the interest just grew. I, after the first season that she sat with me and watched it through, the interest grew so much to the point where she was playing mad with me, you know, learning playbooks and all this stuff. And, uh, and now, oh, she's fully ingrained Bill's Mafia now. So there's there's no turning back now. Ooh, definitely. Justin? So Jordan, you're, you're, you're at a bar. You're ordering a plate of chicken wings. How are you getting them sauced? What kind of wings do you want? Blue cheese ranch. Give us the whole rundown. Okay, order, okay. You want a little order bit of chicken here? wings? Where are you uh, getting them? All that. I'm, okay, where am I getting them? That's a good question. Uh, I you really can be like in when Buffalo I'm in, or when Rochester. I'm in Buffalo. I, re I really like Bella Pizza out there in Buffalo. They're they're a big time uh, for me. I like them a lot. I'm not trying to impress anybody, so I'm like a medium Buffalo guy. You know, uh, not too hot, not too mild. Uh, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie. If I'm gonna dunk, it's obviously blue cheese. I'm not too much of a dunker, you know. I like a nice sauce, a little bit here and there. Definitely on the celery, blue cheese for sure. And uh, I and uh, to settle the debate, I, I like drums. Uh, I like I like them all. I like flats, but I'm I'm a drum guy for sure. Flats. I'm a flats guy. Yeah, you. Hey, you know what can you do? You, you scream drum boy to me, Jordan. I'm a drum guy. You know, I go against the grain. <laughs> I got Our, one more for you, Jordan. Yeah, but let's go. No holds barred, whatever you want to say. What's, what is your favorite Bill story of all time? You can be involved in it. It can be something you watched, something you heard of from a, a generation before you. What's your favorite Bill story? Uh, honestly, I, I got to be honest with you here. Uh, uh, the, it was the Andy Dalton touchdown uh, that catapulted us into the uh, breaking the playoff drought. And honestly, watching Kyle Williams in the locker room, I mean, I, I was sitting at my house. I had all my friends over. We were having a little party. I had to excuse myself because I was very emotional. And at the time's fourth quarter, Miami's coming back in their game. We're, you know, we're kind of losing a little bit. And then – uh, we we're coming back, and then I'm like, you know what? There's no shot. I don't know if it was a fourth and 17 or what it was. And then when Andy connected in the end zone there, I mean, I broke, I jumped up and down. I broke the folding chair I was sitting in. I, I think I might have ripped the ceiling fan off, and uh, I started crying profusely. And uh, all my friends were there to console me, uh, but they were tears of joy, I assure you. So yeah, you locked think... yourself in your room again? <laughs> no, oh no! I made pizza and wings for everybody. <laughs> oh, perfect! I think I think we talked about it on this podcast before, but I was at work at uh, Rochester's finest Italian restaurant that day, and nice. You guys both know him. I won't use last names, but I was working with Mike, and it was like the only other Bills fan on staff. You know, 
that whole restaurant is just devoid of Bills fans somehow. And I just remember I was managing the restaurant and I just completely lost touch of like the situation and who I was in that moment and everything. And I just sprinted across the across the room and he had his arms open and like he wanted a hug and like nah like I jumped into his arms like a little baby like bro we've been waiting 20 years for this that was 20 years in the making dude yeah, um, what was, a sweet moment it was it was a that was a fucking wild day oh no doubt yeah that was the turning point that was the paradigm shift and now we're on to bigger and better things right we're throwing the touchdown passes we're not waiting for it Man, if I had to, back to your other question, too, if I had to describe it one word or two touchdowns, man, holy cow, it was like touchdown time. I got this little bell that I ring whenever we score, and my uh, wrist was getting tired. It was unbelievable. (laughs) Get some purple tunnel. (laughs) I need a brace. Arthritis. (laughs) All right, Jordan, do you have any questions for us? Uh, My question to you is, when you guys get big and famous, and when you're meeting all the Buffalo players, if I could come along with you, that would be great. <laughs> Absolutely. I you know <laughs> you didn't quite phrase it as a question, but yes. Yeah, yes. if if we ever get to that point in It was our more of an assumption than a career, question. Yeah, if yeah. we ever get to that point, Jordan, you're definitely coming you're with already us. There. You just can't go in the locker room because apparently every time you step into the stadium, the Bills lose. So you just oh, to... Uh, to be fair, it was always visiting stadiums. I have been to plenty of wins at at the Ralph uh, or whatever they're calling it these days. Hi, right. Mark. Hi, Mark. Yeah. All right, but to answer your question, yes, you're, you're, yes, we will bring you along if we God ever bless get to that you. point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. Jordan. Well, that wraps up our questions. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. I know it's late for you. You just got out of work and it's 12 o'clock basically oh, Eastern time. So thank you again for sticking through with it and being a part of our show. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much guys for having me on and go oh, Bills. It's a pleasure talking to you, Jordan. Go yeah. Bills. Go Bills. All right. If you'd like to join our show, you can email us at the wandering Buffalo podcast at gmail.com or give us a DM on our social media accounts by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to dive into the meat and potatoes of this episode and talk about injuries. Specifically, we don't want any of this stuff to happen, and we're going to do it from each position. And we're going to pray, 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 None of this stuff actually this happens. Doomed, doomsday scenarios today. Yeah, and we're going to start with the the big one first, quarterback. And it's no secret here, Justin. Jake Fromm. If Davis Webb goes down, it's over. No, <laughs> it's Josh Allen, of course. I think we're both in agreement here that if he goes down, that would destroy one of our most anticipated seasons ever. Maybe my most anticipated season as a Bills fan. And he, that would literally crush and deflate the air out of Western New York. Right, and this is probably the most obvious answer on the list. But also worth discussing because of what we did to address the backup quarterback position. Um, we go from like a year ago, you have Matt Barkley and... I love Matt Barkley. He seems like a great Mm -hmm. guy, all that. Um, But if you had a stretch of like, you know, three to five games and say there's like two division games in there, you know, he's playing meaningful snaps. I don't like the way our season is heading. Um, And we go out and bring in Mitch Trubisky. You know, he's not a world burner as as a starting caliber quarterback, but I think he's easily the best backup quarterback in the league. And if you get into a position where the defense is firing, you can get a little ground game going and have Mitch Trubisky come in to just kind of be there to guide you to a win. I like our chances of winning a few games there. And Mm -hmm. also in that terrible situation, I'm not counting out Mitch Trubisky playing like his career is on the line. And and maybe he really lights it up if that situation comes up. Because he didn't come here and sign a one-year contract to just start his career as a backup. He wants another opportunity to start 
Um, that starts with putting some good film out there. Definitely, and if Trubisky does go out there, best case scenario, hopefully he goes 500. Right. So let's hope for that. Well, let's hope that he never enters the game, but if he does, he goes 500. <laughs> All right, let's transition to the interior offensive line, specifically center and guards. For me, I picked Mitch Morse. I think he's so good, and I really liked how he took the pay cut, even even though he didn't show up to OTAs, but, you know, whatever. But he was willing to help the team out financially when we needed it the most. He's great in space, and not only that, he's he's a fantastic leader. No offense to John Feliciano, but... I'm good on that experiment where we kind of inserted him in there just to see what we could do. I'm not saying that that's what the Bills were trying to do, but from where I was standing, I thought the Bills were trying to see, like, hey, can we put John Feliciano out there in center and maybe we can cut ties with Mitch Morris? I don't know. And I didn't like the outcome of it. No offense. Again, I I just feel like, the team is better with Mitch Morris at center, and if he's out and we have to put John Feliciano at center, then that's just a weak spot at guard. So that's 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 my pick at interior offensive line. Yeah, so I, I have the same name as you here. I went with Mitch Morris as well. Okay. Um, I think he was kind of like a little bit of a weird scheme fit last year, um, mm-hmm. like in the run game and whatnot. I don't know what they're going to do with the run game scheme this year, um, but Mitch Morris is probably top five centers in the league still, if mm-hmm. not top ten. I, you're not getting many centers out there that are better than him. And, yeah, like you said, you know, we have the the quote-unquote flexibility of Feliciano can play the position if he goes down. Well, that just makes us weaker at a guard spot where I already don't think we're very strong. For me, what Mitch Morris brings as like the like the coach of the offensive line, working out the blocking schemes with Josh Allen, I just think that's something that kind of goes underrated or like under the radar as you're just casually watching a game. Um, but I think there's a lot of value that he brings to the team that kind of goes unnoticed. Definitely, let's uh, look to that, you know, outside of the offensive line, specifically tackles. Justin, why don't you lead this one off? Who did you pick? Okay, so this one was kind of a toss-up for me. Um, ideally, I don't want to see either of them go down. Um, mm-hmm. And I, this is similar to the quarterback position for me, where like initially I was looking at the draft and I was like, back-to-back tackles? But I feel a little bit better about the depth we have there now. Um, mm-hmm. For me, I had to go with the snowman here. He's just mm. been consistently good. I think part of having Daryl Williams at your right tackle is the acknowledgement of the inherent risk that he might get hurt. He might go down. Um, he's battled some injuries in his career. This is this past off season is really the first opportunity he had to cash in on playing right tackle. Um, so I think that's kind of built into him that. It's kind of like an if-one situation. Um, So Dawkins being on the other side, consistently there, consistently playing well, I think overall that would be a bigger loss. But for me, it's kind of a toss-up. They they send pressures from every which way. You need both of those players to be playing well. Right. So, Justin... We agree again. We're like three for three, if I'm not mistaken. I picked Deion Dawkins as well. He's a great leader, and to your point, he's so consistent. And Deion Dawkins was he's such he's got such an infectious personality that I never really paid attention to offensive lineman play until we got Deion because he's super likable. So I was like, all right. Let me, let me look at this man, see see what he's doing out there, and he's consistently blocking Josh Allen's blind side, which is a big deal, and that's why the left tackle gets the big money positions, you know. So again, Justin, definitely agree. Deion Dawkins, we never want to see that man go down. Let's talk about the wide receivers. Why don't you leave leave this one off again? Okay, so 
Don't worry, I'm going to start throwing you some curveballs. Okay, okay. So, stay with me here. I feel like Diggs is the obvious choice here. And mm-hmm. for all the various obvious reasons, you know, he catches everything. He always seems to be open. Um, but I'm kind of going off script here into the other guys and who he frees up for everything else. So, yes, all the benefits of Diggs. But my guy Beasley is so integral to this offense. You know, Again, no disrespect to Diggs and what he does for us. But how many times last year did you see – Third and three, third and five, and just third and Cole. Third and Cole, or third and twenty-two, third and seventeen. The plays that shout out to the circling one hundred and uh, uh, the circling wagons podcast. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, there there are so many times that it's we just need this play on third down. You know, this he gutted it out through a, a broken leg. You know, there's just so much that he brings as like that quarterback safety blanket that. You know, if they roll double coverage to Diggs, you know Beasley's open somewhere. And Mm -hmm. I think for this offense to take the next step, if it's possible, the only thing that they could really do is just that little bit more methodical of just sustaining drives and not having boom or bust drive type deal. And Mm -hmm. and Beasley's your guy for that. So I I think he's an invaluable piece to the offense, and he's going to be my pick here. What about you? Well, Justin, this is going to be a very boring episode because we have agreed on everything, and I picked Cole Beasley as well. Did you try to go outside and I, the box too? No, I, I actually really picked Beasley for this because, you know, Cole is legit, in my opinion, Josh Allen's easiest target. He's so good in the slot. We see how impactful he was even on a broken leg. the And I'm just thinking about that one-handed catch that he had. Oh, God, he, he's just so good. There's so many Like, of literally, them. he's... I know. I remember, like, like, third and 22, and he just got, like, table-topped. And I was like, oh, Beasley's about oh. to be done for the rest of the year. And pops up. Yeah, And then he's good got go. the hair. Yeah, I, he literally basically got flipped upside down in the Raiders game. He converted that third and 20-whatever yard against the Dolphins in week two. He's just, he's good. He's Josh Allen's easiest target, in my opinion. And that's why I picked Cole Beasley. But, like, if Beasley goes down right in the slot, who's going to replace him? Isaiah McKenzie? There's a huge drop-off right there. And that's no offense to Isaiah McKenzie, but Cole Beasley is one of the best wide receivers coming out of the slot. So that's that's why I picked him. I thought we were going to switch it up there. Maybe I'll get you on the next well, one. Yeah, let, let me lead this one off. Maybe, maybe you pick the same thing. But who knows? We're going to find out. For running backs, I pick Matt Breida. And I'm saying this because everyone was upset that the Bills didn't have speed coming out of the backfield. Well, now that we got it, what if we lost that speed, Justin? Then we're back to the same two running backs that we had last year, which is fine. I like both Devin Singletary and Zach Moss. However, I like variation, especially when it comes out of the backfield. If Brita goes down, then that's one less card up the bill sleeve that they can deploy in their offense. So that's that's why I pick Matt Brito. Okay, so I I had a I had a tough time with this one. I also almost went Matt Brito, uh, and then kind of circled back on my thought process. Um, it, the pictures of Devin Singletary, he's a monster right now. <laughs> he's working with Delvin yeah, Cook is. in the off season, which I love to see. Um, but as I kind of waffled back and forth, I went with Zach Moss here. Uh, hmm. I feel like he's one of the guys that was really hurt by a weird rookie season with COVID. Then you factor in he had the turf toe. That's a hard injury to come back from. And hmm. you had, you know, the season ending injury. Um, so we're not really entirely sure what he's going to look like this year. But hmm. I think for 
the reason they brought him in and what this offense kind of needs um, to supplement the passing game, which is just electrifying, is just those consistent, you know, third and one, I can give it to my running back and we don't have to call a Josh Allen sweep. Like, second and two, let's take our chances, smash new in the middle here, and then next time we have second and two, we can do a play action and put it over the top. Um, it just kind of seems like Zach Moss is that that mold of running back of kind of what we need just to be productive enough to supplement the offense. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think Singletary scaring anybody between the tackles. And my fear with Brita is he's going to be like uh, just just that high end insurance policy where he might have the TJ Yeldon role where we don't really see him active all that much. So I had to stick with Zach Moss here. Hmm. I agree. I agree. Well, that brings us to one last position on the offensive line or the offensive side of the football, and that's tight end. And I got to pick Dawson Knox here just because there's not much really going on behind him besides Jacob Hollister. It's a big year for Dawson Knox to prove himself as an up and coming tight end. But he needs to stay healthy for it, and he needs to can be more consistent. So I'm picking Dawson Knox because I'm not picking Jacob Hollister, basically. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pick Jacob Hollister. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't. Uh, no, no, I did. Really? Yeah. Okay. So there, there was a lot of thought process that went into this one. And it was kind of where I ended up was, you know, we were missing a lot of Dawson Knox last year. Um, And a guy like, you know, Tyler Croft was behind him. And just the consistency of, you know, we're not looking for 150-yard games and three touchdowns every week. That'd be freaking awesome. But Mm -hmm. when Knox was out last year and you had Tyler Croft step in, it was like, these games where he was sound in his blocking assignments and he'd catch four balls for 40 yards and three of them were first down. So it's like, you know, if Dawson Knox comes out the first few weeks and he takes that next step and he's this seam-busting matchup nightmare tight end that we all hope he turns into, sure, it's Dawson Mm -hmm. Knox. Um, But if we get... You know, 2020 Dawson Knox, where maybe there's some injuries, maybe there's just some inconsistencies. I think Jacob Hollister can just be that steady veteran that just catches the ball when his number's called upon, but you don't expect him to have, you know, a 10 catch, 100 yard stat line. I'm, I'm looking mm-hmm. at blocking, you know, literally just Tyler Croft last year. And I think that's a very serviceable role in this offense with all the weapons we have. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Dawson, Dawson Knox taking the league by storm. Right. Well, definitely thinking outside of the box and I like it. Can't say the same names on every one of them. Yeah. Well, you know, we were, we were going stride for stride right there. And (laughs) just that I think that's why you and I work so well together, Justin. We are very like-minded when it comes to uh, our Bills' opinions and thoughts. But we also differ, too, which is great because, I mean, what's a conversation with someone if you guys are going to agree on everything? you gotta have, you have a, you got to have some disagreement. I don't have right? to make you agree with me, but we can at least think. Yeah, for sure. And that's going to wrap it up for the offensive side of the game. But let's, you know, switch gears and focus on what we don't want to see on the defense, starting with the interior defensive line. Justin, what did you pick? Uh, Who did you pick? Sorry. I might upset some of Bill's Mafia right now. Star Latule for me. I know there's a lot of talk about Star right now. Um, Opted out last year. He hasn't been at OTAs. For me, I don't personally care if veterans show up to OTAs. I think it's a nice thing for, like, team building and all that. It kind of does rub me a little bit the wrong way, being that 
he hasn't played football in a year and you know he's a big guy to start with so you know not only is in is he in shape but you know i um a little off tangent here i remember hearing an interview with kyle williams where he's talking about like the effort that he had to go through to maintain his playing weight of like he'd have alarm set at three in the morning to go eat a full meal and it was like he wasn't eating like you know twinkies and ho-hos it was like 3 a.m he woke up and ate you know 16 ounces of chicken and steamed broccoli so part of Mm. me wonders a little bit about you know how much upkeep has been done there Mm. um but for me there there was so many built-in excuses to our defense kind of underperforming last year and it was a lot Mm. of like this guy's playing out of position this guy can't get free from blocks because we don't have a a bona fide one technique that's eating up the the block or the yeah the blockers there was there was so much of that built into the the defense that even if he comes back and he's just an average one tech what kind of opportunities it should free up for at Oliver you know the, the defensive ends that can't get double team now because you have to double star all that that goes into it just kind of makes him you know if he goes down we're right back to where we were last year where it's like well we still still don't really know about ed oliver because he's back to playing one technique and he's out of position and tremaine underman's like who knows about him he can't play free because we don't have a one technique so right i'm going star there well just when you thought we were like-minded no i'm just kidding i also picked star lutule (laughs) We'll be hated together. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you kind of went over this, but I'll just kind of go over my thoughts real quick. We saw what the Bills' defensive line looked like without Star when he opted out. Players were playing out of position. We couldn't get organic pressure with the front four. And And the running backs that we played cut us down. Plus, we as fans better hope that the man does not retire on us. (laughs) <laughs> and he said he was going to play, but, you know, if he does retire, that's going to hurt us for the aforementioned reasons. But it's going to hurt us when it comes to the cap. It doesn't even save it, cap. It, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it would be one thing like, all right, you want to retire, that's fine. You know, we'll move on. But it's kind of like if he retires, we're, we're going to be down. And then he's going to kick us while we're down because of the money he's going to take with him. It's like when Doug Marone left. <laughs> oh, my God. But that you ended know, up to be like, so, such a beautiful thing. I know, but, you know, when I, when that happened, I was like, wow. And get this knife I out of my back. hate this guy so much right now. <laughs> I still hate him. Yeah, I still, I definitely still hate him. But we'll talk about him another time. Let's talk about the defensive ends. And for me, I I picked Hughes your daddy, Jerry Hughes. He's the most consistent defensive end, in my opinion. He's the big-time leader on that defensive line. He's got a mentor to young defensive ends too, right? You know, Gregory Rousseau and Carlos Basham, Boogie Basham, sorry. They just came into the one Bills drive. And... Outside of him, he he's really doing the most at his position, and I love Jerry Hughes. He means everything to us as fans, and he's pretty much the most the longest tenured Bills, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Reed Ferguson is second behind him. Yeah. So it, if anybody's listened to this show and heard Andrew and I gush about Jerry Hughes, you knew it was the pick here. Um. So I recently predicted Epinesa leading the teams in sacks next year. Um, so that was something that was tossed around in my head of like, I really expect Epinesa to take the next step. But it's kind of like the idea of missing out on what you never had until I see it. Right now, Jerry Hughes is, to me, the only real proven commodity on this team. Mario Addison mm-hmm. has done it, but it's like, I haven't seen it in our uniform. Maybe he'll have a better year. I don't know. But I think what Hughes provides, not only for like his own stat lines, but what he does to help everybody else be better, 
what he's become as a locker room leader, what he means to the team and organization. To, to, to not pick Hughes here would be just a spit in the face of everything he's done for the team. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about cornerbacks and what we don't want to see. And hopefully I'm going to think as far outside of the box, maybe further out than you, hopefully. But I'm going to say Teron Johnson. And I say this because Teron Johnson started last season kind of shaky, right? Then he has these two franchise-altering pick sixes, and now he's super high in Bills Mafia's eyes. Therefore, he's got a lot to prove this season, Justin. And plus, he's in a contract year. Who's behind Who's behind him if he goes down? Cam Lewis, the undrafted free agent out of UB. Rashad Wild Goose I'm this year. Six, yeah, the goose is loose. The sixth, the sixth uh, round draft pick. Unproven commodities. So, I, you know, if he goes down, like, that, that spells trouble for me, in my opinion. W- who do you have? So, while I don't really disagree with you, I have a different answer. Um, this Perfect. is why I was pounding the table so hard for the Bills to take a cornerback. Um, mm-hmm. a, a guy like uh, Melifon Wu would take care of all my concerns here. You know, he could play the boundary. He could play a little bit of the slot. Give me Trill Williams. I picked Trey White here. I, I I can't disagree with anything you said about Darren Johnson, but mm-hmm. the way I'm looking at it is if Trey White goes down for any experience, extended period of time, I'm already looking at CB2 as the weakest spot on the roster right now. So, like... I could easily say Levi Wallace because I don't really know who's stepping in for him. But, you know, mm. if if you got Trey White goes down, now you're looking at probably Dane Jackson and Levi Wallace as your top two. And, you know, Dane Jackson looked good in spots last year, but you're talking Trey White's top five, top ten cornerbacks in the league. And kind of what makes the secondary tick is – the fact that you can leave Trey White alone and you're not really worried about him. So you can use mm-hmm. Hyden Poyer to kind of make up for what you lack in other areas. And it kind of becomes like uh, one and a half on one. You know, it's not really double coverage all the time. But you know somebody's got your back. Um, if you if you have a situation where you got to make up for Trey and you still got Levi on the other side, I'm scared. So I got to yeah. go Trey there. Makes sense. I I definitely don't want to see Tredavious White go down, and I thought he was the obvious pick. So I was like, uh, let me let me try to do something else. And I like the more I thought about Teron Johnson, the more it made sense. Yeah, to and, and I like the direction you took with it, um, just because the Bills don't really play a base defense. Their base defense is basically nickel, so All he's time. always on the field. And the more the league advances, the more you see these dangerous weapons out of the slot. Um, so mm-hmm. he becomes exponentially more important to the defense too. So I can't really disagree with you either. Right, right. Let's move on to safety. And with safeties, it's a coin flip, right? And the way that my coin landed was Micah Hyde. I don't want to see Micah Hyde go down because he's so good at taking away the deep ball and – I just can't see this man, Josh Thomas, back there. I don't want to see that. Micah Hyde keeps everything in front of him, stops the big playability, as I just mentioned. And I think that might just be a little more valuable for me personally. And that's why I don't want to see Micah Hyde go down. So I also did the coin flip here, but my my coin landed on the edge. It wouldn't fall down either way. I, okay. I can't pick. <laughs> I can't pick. Poyer hide over one another. I think they're both mm-hmm. just so good, and they're so good together. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I went to Mar Hamlin here. I, I skipped right over Jaquan Johnson and and Josh Thomas. Interesting. I think they. I think Demar Hamlin projects to go right into that Dean Marlowe role, and mm-hmm. it's easy to forget how many snaps Marlowe took last year. 
I think it was something like 250 snaps, which, you know, that's nothing to sneeze at. He was on the field a good amount. And mm-hmm. it kind of goes to the point of, you know, yeah, it's still a backup player. It's still a defined role. But if you have Poyer and Hyde healthy and that, that third person that you're expecting significant time from – call it Hamlin here, goes down. Now you're looking at Jaquan Johnson. You're looking at platooning some sort of Saran Neal, Cam Lewis based on the situation. And for opposing offenses, if you see Saran Neal go out there, you know what his limitations are. You know why he's not on the field all the time. Same thing for Cam Lewis, um, Jaquan Johnson, Josh Thomas. I think DeMar Hamlin really has a chance to develop in be a significant role player in this defense um so like it easily the answer here is Poyer and or Hyde you know but I can't put that on either of their names right right moving on to the last position on defense linebacker I gotta pick Tremaine Edmonds and I'm saying this because we saw what happened when Matt Milano went down last year and the Bills had to send A.J. Klein down the pipeline after the quarterback. Who takes over for Tremaine if he goes down? Could you imagine if A.J. Klein took over for Tremaine Edmonds? That would be significantly worse than Klein taking over for Matt Milano, in my opinion. I, I just I would literally lose my mind. I, 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 I can't even fathom that. I don't want to see that. Okay, so going to respectfully disagree with you here and i i had this as my second most obvious one on the list Uh, Mm -hmm. for me it has to be matt milano um Mm -hmm. just for what we saw when we didn't have him last year yes edmonds plays better when they're in there together the defense plays better but you don't really have that coverage guy you know tremaine edmonds shows the flash sometimes but it's also not like his primary duty Matt Milano is kind of like your tight end coverage guy and we saw Edmonds get worked by Mahomes moving him off his spot in the AFC championship game with his eyes yeah and I just think Milano plays a more significant role in a defense that's more keyed in on stopping the pass and it's kind of been our mo the past few years that it's like if you guys rush for 200 yards on us whatever like we're gonna throw for 500 and we're gonna win so Mm -hmm. i think this team's not really i think Edmonds does have his glimpses in pass coverage but i think he brings more value to the run game and vice versa for milano where he's better in pass coverage and weaker in the run game and i'm gonna take pass covered coverage over stopping the run any day right well i guess why i picked tremaine edmonds is because the bills when matt milano went down last year they eventually figured out what to do with aj klein they were like all right buddy you can't be out in coverage but you know what you can do you can run in a straight line get Get that guy holding the football, dude. You got it. And AJ Klein was like, Klein, smash. That that <laughs> one game for me when uh, he won the defense, AFC Defensive Player of the Week. Yeah. That game to me was literally like Waterboy. That, that oh, scene, yeah. or not, not Water, well, Waterboy and the replacements. I'm thinking of the replacements. When he goes oh, okay. to coach goes to Danny Bateman, he's like, "I need the ball. Are you gonna get the ball for me, Danny?" And he's like, "I'll get you the ball, coach." It's like, "You're gonna give me the ball. I'll get you the ball." And that that was just AJ Klein for like one week. It, right, he was serviceable right. after that and whatnot, but yeah. that, that's all. Well, that, that was a whole week. There, I had memes and gifts and everything going on of that. That's funny. Well, let's pick the last person that we don't want to see get hurt, and that's special teams. And I pick Reed Ferguson. <laughs> I can't argue Quite with that. literally, he's he's consistent, and we talked about him earlier, so I don't really got much to say about it except for please stay healthy, Reed Ferguson. Yeah, I, I read something the other day. It was something like 
over Reed Ferguson's tenure with the Bills, there's been like 450 long snap situations, like be it field goals, punts, extra points, whatever. It was like something like 450 snaps with like no errant snaps. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of mad that I didn't make this pick because it seems like such a good answer now that I saw that. <laughs> Um, right. But I kind of had a two-part answer here. I know that's not the way we're doing it, but it's the way I'm doing it now. Um, so my number one answer is Tyler Bass. Um, mm-hmm. I think that a field goal kicker isn't easy enough to get a serviceable guy at the position, um, but he kind of showed working through last year that he's that dude, and you know the bombs that he's kicking – the consistency started showing, you know, if you have to go out and get, you know, whatever kicker's available, it kind of closes your opportunities on what you can do in field goal situations. Um, And then my second answer was whoever becomes the primary return guy. Um, Mm -hmm. Andre Roberts leaving, I never thought I'd be so stressed out about a special teams return guy leaving. But we've been so spoiled with Andre Roberts that they're bringing in Lance Lenar, Lance Lenore, Lenore yeah, to take these snaps. They're trying Isaiah. Like the fact that they're bringing in Lance means that they're trying out guys and they're not seeing what they want to see enough. So you're talking it's between Stevenson, McKenzie, Lenore, whoever else they have. If Powell, Powell, yeah, if they're trying this hard to find who they think their guy is and it's not that obvious to them, then I'm worried about what their second choice looks like. And for me, it goes down the road of whenever we had, you know, some special teams issues and we just wanted somebody to just go field a punt cleanly and we don't have to worry about it. They put Micah Hyde out there. I don't want to see that. I understand why they do it at times because you know Micah Hyde's going to just field the punt. But Mm -hmm. that's one of the last guys on the roster I want to see out there subjected to some sort of free hit. Yeah, we definitely don't want to see that. And I agree with, you know, Tyler Bass. You know, we start off rocky, finish strong. Let's hope he stays healthy. And let's hope we never have to see Micah Hyde return a punt. But I think that's going to wrap it up for our episode this week, Justin. Next week, we're going to do a hot take, cold take, call it an icy hot, if you will, Ooh. style episode. Endgame. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, like, comment, subscribe, and review our podcast, as well as other amazing shows that you can find on the Built in Buffalo Network. We were recently a guest on the Buff- Buffalo on the Brain podcast, and we had a blast. So definitely go check that one out. Uh, shout out to Jordan D'Angelo again for being a part of our show uh, this week. Really appreciated him, and it was a fun conversation. We're always looking for guests on the show, as I mentioned before, so you can reach out to us on our social media platforms if you're interested by, again, searching the Wandering Buffalo podcast. Justin, where can the people find you? So if anybody needs me in, like, the next 10 to 20 minutes, I'm going to be outside doing some sort of ritual dance to – shake off all this voodoo of even thinking about injuries. In the meantime, Mm -hmm. if you want to find me on social media, you can find me at jgods22. And as always, you can find me by searching 2 Changs. I'm going to go punch some wood. Punch all the wood. Not knock. I'm just going to, yeah, all the wood in my apartment. (laughs) All right. Well, I think the last thing we got to do is uh, say go Go Bills. Bills. Lumber prices are high. (laughs) Yeah, lumber prices are real high. I'm going to punch sawdust. (laughs) See you next week.